Good afternoon, Guy. Um, thank you very much for uh, agreeing to uh, have taken an interview from me. I'm My name's Philip, and I'm doing an MSc in Digital Transformation at Hull University. And as a part of the, the course, which is taking more than two years, uh, the final dissertation involves a, an in-depth in project, and uh, I decided to choose the subject of unlearning. And during those last sort of nine months, I've been watching people online, on um, listening to, to discussions about learning, and particularly I've seen yourself quite a few times, Nick Shackleton-Jones and uh, Mark James and other people who um, come close to talking about unlearning, but it's not a very, very popular thing subject. So uh, I wanted to speak to you particularly because you have um, a lot of experience um, and I think you have some interesting things to say. And I would be like to begin, if it's all right with you, by asking you about your about that experience you've got in, in learning, in the learning industry, and what sort of training you've been involved with. All right. Thank you. I'm happy to help, Philip. Uh, so I began in the learning and development space back when it was called training and development or just instruction back in 1979. And I have a radio TV film degree. And while I was going to college, I worked part-time for a lumber company, had 283 lumber centers across North America. Um, and they invited me to come to their headquarters when I got my degree and join their training services organization. And so that's when I began back in 1979. And I was oriented to performance, a performance-based approach to instruction or training or learning. And after a year and a half doing that, I joined Motorola in the Chicago suburbs. And I worked for them for about a year and a half. And then I joined a small training consulting firm and I was put in charge of the training practice. And the founder of the company was involved in strategic planning for training and development functions for major enterprises. He was a former Bell Labs engineer and, and uh, he appealed to high tech companies who needed to get a handle on their learning and development efforts for high stakes performance. And so I had part of the business and he and our other partner, uh, uh, primarily focused on strategic planning kinds of issues. But we also uh, integrated uh, a lot of total quality management tools and techniques into our approach to training because one of the things that we often find when we're doing analysis of the performance requirements is that if there are gaps in the current state performance, they're most, most often due to things other than knowledge and skills. And so there might be a bad process or bad data or bad tools or inadequate uh, resources for the learners who are really performers. But anyway, that's my background. So I've been doing this for 43 plus years now. Great. And um, I noticed, you know, you mentioned the first one was the lumber company. And then I think you said Motorola. And I wondered what the differences you found there was the was the lumber company uh, less high tech when you first started. Uh, yes, it was uh, uh, fairly low tech. Now they were when I joined, they were uh, migrating their mode and media uh, from thirty five millimeter slides with audio tracks uh, to video, and so most of our training was going to be video-based training. Now, we produced, I was part of the program development organization. We did interviews and observations and then wrote uh, scripts and storyboards. And then our video department actually produced the videos. But but so they were, they were not high tech in that, you know, it's the lumber business. So you have, you know, trucks and trains deliver wood products to your lumber centers and customers come in and and buy from you all sorts of different products, kitchen cabinets and water heaters and uh, wood and nails and, and things like that. But when I went to Motorola, of course, they are and uh, were a high tech company back then. And there were five major business sectors. They were producing uh, computer chips in one of their business sectors. Another one was doing communications products such as radios that you'd find in, in trucks and, and uh 
uh, police uh, radios and fire department radios and, and, and communications devices like that. And there were other businesses as well. But but so they were uh, basically a fairly high tech company. Um, and so their, their needs and uh, they were a little bit more sophisticated in terms of the target audiences that we were addressing. Uh, we were addressing, you know, high tech engineers, manufacturing engineers, uh, manufacturing workforce people, um, sales people. Um, it, it, so it was just a, a wider set of jobs and sophisticated jobs across all of Motorola compared to at a lumber center. And did you have to personalize a lot of the training for different kinds of groups of people? Well, our focus was generally on job title by job title. So if you, but that that's not always the case. Sometimes it was on a process. So you could be focused on a process and there could be all sorts of different job titles involved in a process. But the focus is, you know, uh, help train people, develop their performance capabilities to work in a process. And so that's a, that's a kind of a different focus. If you looked at a job title, you might look at, well, what are all the aspects of that job and what are all the tasks performed and outputs produced? And then what are the enabling knowledge and skills? And then what do they already know? Because if you've got degreed engineers and the job requires that they need to have AC, DC electrical theory, well, they already know that because they're degreed engineers. And so you could determine what are the, all the enabling knowledge and skills, but you'd have to look at the target audience and see what are the incoming knowledge and skills of this target audience? What do they already know? And of course, what they already know is not the same for every last person coming in. So you'd have to understand the variances so that you could give people what they needed in order to perform. And another aspect of, of personalization is that just because you and I have the same job title doesn't mean that we do the same things. Job titles are for the convenience of human resources and compensation setting and doesn't necessarily mean that you and I are doing the exact same thing. So that's something that we in learning development have to figure out. We have a job title. We're going after the training and development for them. But do they all do the same things or do you do A, B and C and I do B, C and D? And so there's a difference there. And so personalizing learning requires the learning and development organization to figure out, well, what are the outputs and tasks performed? What are the enabling knowledge and skills? And how is that work allocated across the target audiences? Um, there could be people that are from purchasing and, and engineering and sales and marketing involved in a process and everybody needs to know some things the same and there's tasks they need to perform that are the same, but there are those unique tasks they bring in. So there's this need to understand the whole thing, kind of a, 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 having a systems view of the process, the performance that people are engaged in, and then really figuring out, so who's really doing what and what kind of variances are there? Who's cross-trained on what uh, or needs to be? And again, what are the incoming knowledge and skills? Because the last thing that people need is to be trained on something that they already know. So I was interested that um, about the word systems, and I was wondering how you uh, discover everything you need to know. Do you have to interview people, or could you, how would you find out what you need to know to get the results you, you yeah. need? So there are two major approaches, if you will. And one of them is what I call the traditional approach. It's where you do interviews and you do observations and you do document reviews. Now, I've had to do that on plenty of projects, but I've never, I never felt comfortable that I understood the job at the nuanced level to make sure that I gave the learner everything that they needed to be successful. So... Uh, that would lead to me producing instruction that was incomplete because I simply didn't understand the nuances. Um, and so doing interviews is one way. Of, it's all about getting the data. So again, what are the outputs? 
what are the stakeholder requirements for those outputs? You know, people are on the payroll to produce outputs, not to have knowledge and skills, not to employ certain behaviors. All of those are means to the ends of producing outputs or deliverables or products. But so, and those outputs are inputs downstream. I produce a a, a, a script and and give it to you. You produce a storyboard. You give it to somebody who's going to shoot a video, and they give it to people who are going to edit the video, and they give it to people that are going to, you know, package the video and set, ship it out. So there's a chain of processes, and so one of the ways to understand that is to do the traditional route. That's that's kind of how it was taught when I first got in the business. My preference, however, is to do what I call a facilitated group process. I would ask my clients to identify and handpick the master performers. Uh, these are also called top performers or exemplars. But So you want the people that do the job already to the highest level of performance because you want to teach everybody to be like them, to get them as close to performing at the top levels, at the levels of mastery. So you would, you would assemble a team of master performers and perhaps other subject matter experts. Now we use the phrase, the term subject matter expert to mean, you know, our sources for content development. But but I call them other uh, subject matter experts because I may be looking at an engineering process and I need people from quality to be involved in what we're going to do. I need people from regulate uh, regulatory affairs to be involved because perhaps this is a highly regulated business. Quality issues are supreme and really critical, and engineers have a job to do. So it takes more than just the master performers who may not understand the regulations in depth, but that it's what they must comply with when they're doing their jobs. So, and then I might also involve supervisors of the target audience and sometimes novice performers, but I'm, I'm using a facilitated group process. I wanna assemble a group of these kinds of people, master performers and other subject matter experts, and I wanna facilitate them to produce the analysis outputs. And later on, I'll facilitate them to design the instruction. And later on, I might facilitate them as a group to produce the content, to develop the content. And, and so th that's quicker. <laughs> And so, but sometimes it's not feasible for the for for my clients to pull the best people off the job to meet with me in a group setting. But but one of the things we're always contending with when we're trying to understand the job is that there's this issue of automated knowledge, the non-conscious nature of knowledge. You can tell me what you do and how you do it. But what the research shows is that as you're making decisions, as you do your work, you only have available to you to relate to me 30% of how you make decisions. You've automated how you make decisions and it's non-conscious. It's not available to you to share with me. So if I rely on you to, to package some content for instruction or training purposes, it's going to be missing 70% of what a novice needs. And if you were to tell me what all your procedural tasks, the behavioral tasks that we can observe and we can measure them and we can count them, you're going to be missing up to 50% of those because you've automated those. You can do the work, you can make the decisions, but you can't relate them to me because you've automated all of that. So this is a challenge, which is why I like to use a group process and bring in a team of people who will fill in the gaps. When you say, okay, I do one, two, and three, somebody else in the room might say, well, Phil, in between one and two, aren't you also doing this thing and that thing and this third thing? And you might say, oh, I guess you're right. And so when I'm trying to go as fast as I can and do as high a quality job as I can and make my content accurate, uh, complete, and appropriate, but if I rely on just one person or I rely on my abilities to do interviews and observations, I'm going to generate content that is incomplete. And if if the content that we're developing relates to high stakes performance, high risks, high rewards, well, that's an inappropriate, incomplete process. That's an inappropriate process for us to utilize to generate instructional content 
that's going to guide somebody in doing high stakes critical performance. Now, if it's low stakes, who cares? Uh, I'll learn it. It'll be incomplete and I'll go to try to apply it in my job and I will have to go to trial and error learning because what I was given was incomplete. And I'll have to figure that out on my own on the job or I'll employ social learning and ask somebody else what they think. Of course, what they tell me is also going to be incomplete because of the non-conscious nature of knowledge. They've automated how they do things. And so if I talk to enough people, I may get a complete picture of this because, again, what the research shows is that the 30% that you know, that I know consciously and can share is different. You've automated a different 70% of everything, and I've automated another different 70%. And what the researchers who really study this say is that you need to interview three to five people and you'll get about as complete as you can get. Um, but anyway, so those are the issues. That's how you go about gathering this data. But this is critical. The upfront thing is to figure out well, what's required and how do you do that performance? And when your sources have limitations because of this non-conscious nature of knowledge, that's a big, huge issue. And it's something that I think the learning and development field uh, is terrible at. They're not, they don't recognize that this is a real world issue and that they need to have uh, philosophies and processes and practices in place that help them uncover all of these details that are missing if we go with the traditional single source approach, which is real traditional. Uh, I interview you, you're my subject matter expert. I take everything that you say, I package it into a program and we release that. Well, on low stakes performance, who cares? Uh, the learners will figure it out. They'll figure out what's missing and they'll they'll get on with it. But if it's really high stakes performance where there's life and death involved, you've got to be much more careful and more judicious in how you go about generating content and testing it before you release it and give it to people and then, you know, walk off to the next job. So I um, imagine that you've had some good successes, but I'm, have you learned anything in this process where you, from having made mistakes with this, what you're telling me about? Uh, yes. I, so I think that uh, one of the things I recognized early, I, I learned about this non-conscious nature of knowledge about 20 years ago. But 40 years ago, one of the things I recognized is that every time I generated content and took it out for review, people amended it. They added things to this. Sometimes they made corrections, but more often they found omissions, uh, uh, errors of omission. Well, this is missing. There's, you know, tasks in here that you're missing. Oh, here's knowledge and skills that aren't reflected here. Why did somebody not know that that you needed to know this and or know that? And so I recognize the importance of testing and what we normally call developmental testing. So I do analysis, I do design, then I start developing my content. And as I develop my first draft and second draft and third draft, in between those drafts, I need to take that off for review. And I need people to do a, that know the job and know the topics, the subject matter, to do a thorough review and help me find where what I'm missing and in, in, you know, correct any inaccuracies because maybe I misheard something and then it got reflected in a draft. So I need to catch all of that. And I found that really I, I really needed to do several rounds of developmental testing. And then I would do in my own processes what I call the pilot test many different names for this. But basically, I would tell my clients, all right, so I'm going to do the development and I'm going to review it and update it and review it and update it and review it and get ready for a pilot test. And then I want to bring in the real target audience members so that I can measure, does learning occur? What did they know before they came in the door? What do they know when they when we're all done? Can I And I can measure that. But is it accurate, complete, and appropriate? Well, the learners can't tell me that because they didn't know it before they learned it. So so one of the things about the, the pilot test is that I would always ask for a second audience of master performers and other subject matter experts who really understand this and can sit in judgment of my content into whether it's accurate, complete, and appropriate. 
but I can't measure learning with them. I can't say this is effective learning. They can only tell me whether this is any good or not, but they can't tell me whether it's a good learning vehicle to help people develop their performance competence. So I need those two audiences here to test to see if learning occurs and whether the learning was any good or not and complete or not. Did your employees that you were training, did they find it easy to tell you if there was something wrong or ask for help with the program? And was the communication good or was there, was there any siloing going on? Well, uh, so uh, now I've had a consulting firm my first 20 out of the 40 years that I've been a consultant where I had a staff of between 15 and 25 people. So when I developed my own staff, they could they could tell me they could tell me and we could eventually figure out whether or not you know what we taught somebody how we sh showed them uh, how to do their work whether or not they had learned it and whether they were applying it so we were closer to that because we but for my clients um learners don't know what they need to know what they know already whether they know things that are actually wrong <laughs> and and so they can't tell you whether or not what they've learned was good or what what mistakes they're making. They don't often know that. And so it really requires a kind of a collaborative effort of, of me developing training for the learners and then the learners management, their supervision. Um, they are the ones who can see whether or not, you know, somebody learned something and brought it back to the job and was applying it successfully. Um, sometimes supervisors don't know their people's jobs well enough to really provide that kind of assessment and coaching because, you know, they had other parts of, they, they grew up in the organization and they had jobs A and B, but they can't manage jobs C and D because they never did that. And now they're the supervisors of A, B, C, and D. So they're at a disadvantage because they can't really guide people. They can't assess, monitor their work and troubleshoot it because of their own experience and, and and lack of knowledge about the specifics, the nuances again of the job. You know, performance can be quite tricky. It's not always road. It's not just as easy as one, two, three, A, B, C. It's convoluted. And sometimes it's it needs to respond to the situation differently. And so sometimes people don't know, how do I assess the situation to figure out, do I do it the standard way or do I have to adapt the standard process slightly and in what ways to accommodate this new situation that I'm in. Um, well, I, I mentioned uh, Peter Senge in my information and he he, he, he thinks that uh, organizations, it's better if everybody's talking to everybody you know, so that your line manager would talk to, would talk to the employee and the employee would talk to you and the line manager and maybe even the, the board members might join in and uh, that would really solve a lot of problems, but it sounds terrifically, um, I mean, it sounds very idealistic to me. What do you, th do you think about that approach? Well, I think it is idealistic. And if I was dealing with really high risk, high reward stakes, then I would want to do that. And there are methods, um, a colleague, uh, not a colleague, but somebody that I know from my professional organization, Bill Daniels, ran this kind of an approach with managers where he formed teams and got them to interact with each other in a very engineered way to facilitate the communications that were required top down and then bottom up. And it takes more than one conversation. It takes a chain of these con kinds of conversations to communicate up and down the organization. Now, I think that you know, Peter Senge uh, wrote about this and it's been, you know, 31 years since I read that book because I read it when it first came out because all my clients were reading that book, uh, The Fifth Discipline. And uh, but but it reminded me of what I had learned about participative management or what what Lickern called systems Four, and that kind of an organization where there was the sharing of information up and down and all of that. And and I, it is idealistic. I think it's necessary in certain cases. Um, the higher the risks, the higher rewards, then you need to employ those kinds of mechanisms to facilitate communications up and down the organization. 
uh, decisions, uh, recommendations, um, options, and all of that needs to be communicated up and down. And serious business decisions need to be made. Um, and not everybody can know everything. And so I, I think that I, I like that, but it's not necessarily practical. Now, when I had my own staff, I ran those kinds of meetings to share with my staff you know, the issues, the challenges that we were facing or that our clients were facing, which were now our issues, and so that they could feel engaged and they can help us serve our clients better. They may have greater insights than I do. I'm I'm, I'm not a technical person. I don't know computers, you know, it, to the depth that my staff did. And they could see you know what how we might serve our customers better but but then again i had staff members who wanted us to buy software and tr get them send them off to training on that software that my clients didn't use so we would produce something that my clients couldn't use they couldn't update it they couldn't maintain it over time and so but my staff they didn't see that they really wanted to learn this software cuz they thought that's cool stuff but it had no it had a business application for us but it wasn't didn't serve our clients well. And so they struggled with that. So it's one thing to say, you know, idealistically, we should have all this communications in that, but we've got to understand that not everybody's going to appreciate what's really important and critical to the over, to the client, to our company. And they might look at this kind of in terms of their own self-interest and that might drive their decisions and their, you know, how they act in in the workplace. And so it's never as clean and smooth as one might wish. Um, I think I think of you as a, a person who's inquiring into almost like a scientist into the process that you're using as you're going along and uh, learning from your own experience whilst you're working on what you're doing. And I think that that is how the learning organization should be should be defined as people, everybody in the company, while they're working, thinking about what they're doing, maybe making notes and writing a diary and, and using their own experience to learn as they go along. Is that your understanding of that? And could that be beneficial? Well, I, yeah, I think so. There's, you know, this is, again, it's not simple. It's fairly complicated and convoluted. Um, I can be learning from my experiences. And ideally, maybe I should be sharing that with certain people. But I not, may not even know who those certain people would be. Who really needs to know what I know? And so um, I had a client who uh, back in the 80s, it was at and it was product managers and product managers really wanted to learn from other product managers. They wanted to, the younger people wanted to talk to the older people that had a lot of experience because they were struggling with certain things in their work on their product teams. And they wanted to, to be able to talk with and ask questions of people who may have been there and done that, may already know how to approach certain situations. And so I was involved in creating a, an eight-day training course for brand new product managers. Very complicated, you know, how to run a product team through the various life cycles, how to measure your financial success and other metrics that, the, of, of your progress in, in managing a product team through through its evolution. Um, and my clients had an annual uh, sales uh, conference where marketing got to attend because after all, depending on who you talk to, sales reports to marketing because marketing decides what products we're going to bring to the market, what markets are we going to serve, what features are we going to put in there. Sell, salespeople, you just sell that stuff. So the marketing people would show up to this national sales conference and they would want to break off and talk to themselves rather than talking to the salespeople, which is why they were there, to learn what the salespeople could tell them about the customers and how the customers felt about your products. So, so if they, if my, so I, I remember suggesting to my client that, well, maybe you need to uh, have the marketing people show up to this national sales conference so they can hear from the salespeople about what the customers are saying and what the customers want next and what they think about the products in its current state. But then afterwards, you might uh, keep the marketing people there for an extra day or two so that they can talk to each other and learn from each other. Well, you know, taking people off of work and into a conference situation, you know, that just, that didn't fly. 
They didn't want to do that. Nowadays, though, but because that was the mid 80s. Nowadays, people have all this social media, all these different ways to connect. And so a company could help or people organize around the kinds of work that they're doing, the kinds of issues and challenges that they face. So we have the technology to enable us to do that. But somebody needs to be kind of orchestrating this without it being so top down. But at the top, they need to they need to put things in place that make it easier for people to reach out and find who has similar issues, who has answers to my questions. Um, and the people that participate in that and share what they know need to be rewarded for that, need to be recognized for that, because otherwise I'm too busy being successful for me to worry about the success of everybody else. So in the short term, I'm doing what's best for me, but in the long term, maybe I want to do what's best for the company. But so when push comes to shove, I've got to focus on me and being successful for m myself, my organization, my customers. I can't worry about everybody else and there, there's no reward for it. In fact, I may be punished for it because I spent time helping others to the detriment of my current work, and now I've missed a scheduled deadline. But, but but it was because I was helping somebody else make you know million dollar sales, but but now I'm going to be punished. So our consequence system that we have in place needs to be approached from a systems engineering standpoint. What are we trying to do? We've got the current things to do. Guy needs to do well for his job but he can also help others. So we need to engineer part of Guy's job and the compensation and rewards and recognition systems to encourage Guy to help share and grow other people. You know, normally we think managers are supposed to do that, but again, the manager might not understand job C and D. They only know A and B because that's what they used to do before they became a manager. They can't help the people doing C and D. So how do we help the people that have those needs and maybe it's other people who are more senior to them or people in other functions who know the regulations inside and out and you've got to comply with the regulations when you're doing your job you just don't have anybody in your close network that really knows them so how do we make these connections this is tricky and this is the challenge for businesses and of course is businesses grow in size and become more complex, the challenge grows with that. And sort of coming on, going on from there, there's the idea that some, um, uh, Mark Hamill used to talk about, or talks about, or used to talk about, um, he said that um, you needed to reinvent the company in order to uh, be, stay profitable in the future and constantly be thinking of, but this seems to be a problem for learning and development. I think it have, have a very specific role to do, is, would you say? Well, yeah. So, you know, learning and development organizations, the learning and development function does not own all learning in an enterprise. They don't. <laughs> they need to stay in their lane. They need to package formal learning. And, and they need to be cognizant of informal learning and that it's the, the major way that most people learn how to do their jobs at the nuanced level. But it's the rest of the organization that's also in the learning business. And even if they don't have that in their job title or their job description, if you are a team player, then you will help others on your team learn. And you want to learn from them. And if you're the supervisor of that group, then you need to encourage those kinds of things because people growing and developing and learning what works and what doesn't work and when to do this and when to do it some other way, that's all critical. But and those that's learning. And but the learning and development function, that organization, they can't be in control of all of that. It's every supervisor and manager's job, and it's the, every executive's job to put a system in place to help and encourage people to learn. Now, there's a time and a place when people should take some time to learn things. And there's other times and places where they should defer that and do that later because there's something that we need to do. We have a deadline here on a multi-million dollar thing. 
and we can't take time to learn about something that will be important next month or next quarter. But management needs to structure jobs and work assignments in such a way that there is time for that. And then leave it to me to decide, can I do that today or should I do that you know, in a couple of days here because I've got work here that needs to be done and produced by a deadline and it's got to be high quality. So I can't take time to learn about other things now, but I need to have some time and space and the tools available to me, the technology available to me to help me learn. And management can put those kinds of things in place. The learning and development organization might help management decide what they might put in place to facilitate all of that. But the learning and development function does not own all learning. And sometimes they act as if they do, and they don't. The the the, um, the subject that I'm focusing on is unlearning. And I think it has a lot of, I mean, if you believe there is such a thing, it has a lot of relevance for everything you've said. But uh, what do you think about unlearning? Yes, so unlearning is a very interesting topic. In fact, there are some people who would dispute that you don't unlearn anything. You you uh, overlay a new learning on top of it. So I'm not sure that we can, you know, so this is all the semantics of, of what, what does this really mean? Am I wiping the slate clean and now it's no longer accessible to me? Or did I really just learn that what I knew in the past is wrong, <laughs> is incorrect for whatever reason? And now I've got to learn, not only is that incorrect, but what's the correct things that I need to know? And so I I think this is this is tricky. And I think it's uh, one of the things is, you know, how do I recognize that what I know is incomplete or inaccurate or inappropriate? Um, you know, there's um, there's different approaches to management. You know, there's what we in the in the United States here might say there's good cop behavior and bad cop behavior. And we tag team and and we approach somebody and uh, I beat them up and you are nice to them. So they're nice to you and they'll maybe give you what we want. But they're you know, they're afraid of me, and but they're looking for your support. So there's a time and a place for all of those kinds of things. And and so one of the things I think that about unlearning uh, when I think about it is that I need to help people come to grips with the fact and reconcile the fact that what they knew isn't correct. It is either incomplete or it's inaccurate or it's a little bit of both. Um, or it's inappropriate for this situation. Maybe that's okay in other situations, but not in our situation. So, So what I need to understand is what are the issues with what I know? that would cause me to want to learn something else in addition to that. And I don't think that I unlearn so that I don't know, I don't remember that that's wrong. You know, there's a big, huge issue about learning styles. So learning styles are promoted by universities all throughout the whole world, it seems. And the research shows that they're, it's a bogus concept. It's, a, it's not valid. But yet people gravitate to this thing. So if I once believed in learning styles, I need to know that it's wrong. I need to remember what's wrong about it. And I need to learn, what do I do instead? How do I approach this? What was I trying to do with learning styles? And so uh, unlearning, regardless of the language and people taking exception to it, I, I think it's really critical that we, uh, to grow and develop, we need to move away from things that were wrong in the first place or are wrong recently because of new tools, new techniques, new research that shows that something isn't quite right. People believe in left brain, right brain kinds of things, yet the research says that that's not really true. But yet we, we, we think about this and we may even act on this or have acted on that in the past, but we shouldn't act on that in the future. <clears throat> right. I'm, I, I'm, um, it's great that you understand that so well because that's very crucial to what I'm uh, studying. And the other thing about it is that I think I suspect you've heard of Russell Ackoff because you mentioned uh, omitting to make a mistake, uh, making a mistake that you. Yeah, we could talk about that. As a, he, he says, the first thing you need to be able to do is to detect that you've actually made a mistake uh, in order to learn from it, and then. Um, but there's different kinds of mistakes. There's mistakes where you commit the mistake yourself. And there's a mistake when you 
omit to do something that could have really been beneficial. Uh, and, uh, he says that's a, a, a mistake of um, omission. I heard you use that phrase before. Yeah. I so I'm not a student of his, but uh, but I but I know the name and I've heard the name for forty years. Um, but yeah, so I think that you know. So there's there, so when I was when I had my own company with staff, I wanted people to be able to deal with their uh, mistakes. If they made a mistake, I wanted them to learn from their mistake. But sometimes we're encouraged to hide our mistakes and not acknowledge them. And in fact, sometimes we resist hearing that we had made a mistake because we don't want to admit that. And that's because of the kind of organization we exist within. It could be that the organization punishes mistakes. Oh, they can put posters on the wall and they can, you know, tout the fact that, you know, we want to learn from our mistakes. And the, and the CEO could be saying that, but if my manager punishes me for making a mistake because it makes them look bad, well, then I'm going to learn to hide my mistakes. And so this is about psychological safety and, 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 you know, this goes back to the culture. What does the culture tolerate? What does it allow? How does the culture react? And, but I always worry about, you know, cultural kinds of things because I don't think there is one culture in an organization. There's a culture at every supervisor or every team leader or every middle manager. There's a bunch of cultures. And, and it's influenced by the consequence system that's in place, which is a function of, you know, the organization and its rules and its expectations and its policies and its procedures. But that's all implemented by a manager. A, a manager, an individual manager can decide that, okay, guy, yeah, you really screwed up. That's okay. I, don't worry about it. I, I'll cover it. I'll fix it. I, don't worry about it. And it goes away and it's not a big deal. And and they can come and talk to me and help make sure that I've learned, you know, the right lesson without it being punitive. Another manager in the next department could be punishing people for making a mistake because now they've got to clean up that mess. And they're going to remind them and hound them over and over again not to make that mistake again. And that has to do with people and managers. Well, who's allowing my manager to be okay with a mistake and help me learn and grow from it? And who's the manager of that other manager? Who's So this is the chain of command. And, and this is where this all becomes very difficult because people don't fit into an easy, into a box easy, into a certain kind of a label. And we can all talk about wanting to establish a, a psychologically safe environment for our people to work, to make mistakes and learn from them and grow. But it's the managers or whoever else is in control of the consequence system and provides negative consequences for certain things or reinforces with consequences that uh, I, I, you made that mistake. What do we need to learn from that and reinforce the fact that that's okay, that nobody's perfect. And so uh, this is a huge issue and this is a challenge. And this has to do more with recruiting and selection, selecting our managers, the so-called leaders, but the all from a team leader to supervisor to managers, first level managers, middle managers, executives. And we learn from to behave in ways that are consistent or acceptable to the people that, you know, can observe what we're doing. So it all starts at the top, in my view. So people at the top have to walk the talk and have to make sure that everybody is walking the talk all the way down to the individual employee contributors. Well, thank you very much indeed, um, Guy. I, it's very kind of you to let me interview you. And uh, I, that was very helpful. And I'm, I've got a lot of information you provided me with. So I'm going to... Uh, have a lot of fun transcribing that. And I'll send you it eventually. <laughs> well, I'm I'm happy to participate, and I'm sorry that I couldn't be as uh, ac as brief as uh, possible. It's just not in my nature. <clears throat> That's fine. Uh, thank you again, and uh, have a great evening uh, or afternoon where you are. And um, uh, I'll, I'll be looking out for you online, watching some more of your excellent uh, conversations and, and um, discussions.
Well, I'm happy to help out, Philip. Good luck with your uh, effort. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.